Side 2. Unit 6. Following signpost words. Extract 1. Listen to the following possible ways of completing sentences 1 to 10, and pay attention to the intonation patterns the speakers use. 1. Incoming governments often make promises which they cannot keep. For instance, they say they will reduce unemployment, but the number of people out of work remains static. 2. Every Roman town had at its centre a forum where people came together to conduct their official and religious affairs. In addition, the forum was used as a meeting place. 3. The meteorological office predicted rain for the two weeks of the Olympic Games. In consequence, there were fewer spectators than we had anticipated. 4. Learning a foreign language can be difficult and at times frustrating. However, the rewards usually outweigh the difficulties involved. 5. Not only did the Second World War result in the displacement of millions of innocent civilians, it also caused tremendous political change. 6. Despite the efforts of the government to reduce the incidence of smoking among teenagers and young adults, I regret to say that smoking is not in decline. 7. This is how to approach writing an essay. First, you should read the question carefully. Then you should make some notes covering your main ideas. After that, you can start writing. 8. No matter how hard you try to justify the sport of fox hunting, the fact remains that animals are slaughtered simply to provide entertainment for humans. 9. Firstly, I would like to talk about the early life of J.F. Kennedy. Secondly, we will look at the period of his presidency. And thirdly, we will review the effects of his assassination. 10. On the one hand, it may be advisable to study hard the night before an exam. On the other hand, it's wise to get a good night's sleep before sitting a test. Unit 6, Extract 2. You're going to hear a student, Ben, talking to two other students and his tutor in a tutorial. First, look at questions 1 to 7. Now listen and complete the notes by filling in the numbered spaces 1 to 3 and labelling the diagram 4 to 7. Oh, OK, <laughs> come on in. Hi, Ben. Hi. Hello, Mark, Sally. Oh, well, let's get going, shall we, because we've got a lot of ground to cover this afternoon. Mm. Um, oh, it's Ben's turn to give his tutorial paper today. But remember, we do encourage questions from the rest of you, so do try to join in and ask questions. OK. Now, I believe Ben's going to talk to us today about the exploration of the Red Planet. That's right. I'm going to be looking at the recent landing by the Americans of a spacecraft on the planet Mars, and in particular focusing on the small rover robot. Is that the little robot that functions as a geologist? Yes, that's right. It's called a rover, like a land rover, I suppose, uh -huh. and it can detect the geological composition of the ground it's standing on. So, yes, it's a sort of geologist. <laughs> It's actually quite amazing. I heard it described as being like a microwave oven on wheels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, from an appearance point of view, that's a fair description. I've photocopied a picture of it for you oh. so that you can keep this for reference and make some notes, and I'll just hand that out now. Oh. Thanks. 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 Wow. You'd actually expect it to look more space-age than this, wouldn't you? Like, more sophisticated? <laughs> OK, well, as you can see, it's quite small. It actually only weighs 16.5 kilograms. Right. 
And what kind of speed is it capable of, then? Um, well, I suppose that depends on the terrain. Mm. But I understand that it has a top speed of 2.4 kilometres an hour, which isn't very fast, really. And can you tell us how it works? Explain some of these things we can see here. Well, first of all, on the top it's fitted with solar panels. Mm. It runs on solar energy, of course. Does that mean it can't work at night? Yes, indeed it does. I guess it sleeps at night. <laughs> <laughs> so, you have the solar panels on the top, and underneath, this is the part known as the warm box. What's the purpose of that? Well, at night, the temperatures on Mars can go below 100 degrees, so... The warm box is designed to protect the electronics from the extreme cold. Oh. It's also fitted with two cameras on the front. OK. And what about its wheels? It's got six aluminium wheels, each 13 centimetres in diameter. Each one has its own motor, so it's individually powered, which allows the vehicle to turn on the spot if necessary. Right. And, as you know, aluminium is very light. Mm. Now look at questions 8 to 10. Listen to the end of the conversation and complete the notes by filling in numbered spaces 8 to 10. Uh -huh. And how is it steered? Good question. It's steered using virtual reality goggles, worn by someone back on Earth, believe it or not. <laughs> Though, because the robot can't be manipulated in real time, it can't be steered in real time either. What do you mean exactly? Yeah. Well... You see, it takes more than 11 minutes for a radio signal to travel from command headquarters in California to Mars and another 11 minutes for the answer to come back. You mean there's a time delay? <laughs> yes, exactly. And the time delay, or time lag, means it can't be steered directly from Earth. So what they do is this. They photograph the area around the rover and the scientists will decide where they want the rover to go. In other words, they'll plot a course for the rover? Exactly. OK. Ben, that's very interesting. Now, can you tell us anything about this space mission itself, and why Mars? Well, people have been fascinated by Mars for a long time, and it's generally believed that Mars is the only other planet in the solar system to have abundant water. Right. Is it possible that people might one day be able to live on Mars? Well, of course, there's a lot of work to be done yet, but theoretically, I can't see why not. Thanks, Ben. That was very interesting. Mm. Unit 7. Being aware of stress, rhythm and intonation. Unit 7. Extract 1. Listen and compare these speakers' intonation patterns with your own. A. Urban society began when hunter-gatherers learnt A. How to farm land B. How to domesticate animals and C. How to build permanent structures to act as shelter. B. There are three levels of government in Australia. Firstly, there is federal government. Then there is state government. And thirdly, we have local government. C. There are three levels of government in Australia. Firstly, there is federal government which looks after issues of national importance, such as immigration and defence. Then there is state government, located in each capital city, and which has responsibility for such things as education, the police, and urban and regional planning. And thirdly, we find local government, which controls services such as waste collection, public libraries and childcare centres. D. Was Napoleon poisoned, or did he die of natural causes? The Napoleonic Society of America, an association of historians and collectors, has given a modern twist to this debate. They have done this by revealing the results of chemical analyses of hair said to have come from the head of the French emperor. E. The many forms and styles of handwriting which exist have attracted a wide range of aesthetic, psychological and scientific studies, each with its own aims and procedures. Moreover, each of the main families of writing systems, European, Semitic, East Asian, 
has its own complex history of handwriting styles. Unit 7, Extract 2. In this section, you will hear part of a lecture on child language acquisition. First, look at questions 1 to 10. Now listen and complete the notes in the numbered spaces 1 to 10. Today, in our series of lectures on human language, we're going to be looking at the way in which children acquire language. The study of how people learn to speak has proved to be one of the most fascinating, important and complex branches of language study. So, let's look at these three features in turn. Firstly, why is it fascinating? This stems from the natural interest people take in the developing abilities of young children. People are fascinated by the way in which children learn, particularly their own children. Secondly, it is important to study how we acquire our first language, because the study of child language can lead us to a greater understanding of language as a whole. The third point is that it's a complex study. And this is because of the enormous difficulties that are encountered by researchers as soon as they attempt to explain language development, especially in the very young child. In today's lecture, we will cover a number of topics. We will start by talking about research methods. There are a number of ways that researchers have investigated children's language, and these include the use of diaries, recordings and tests and we'll be looking at how researchers make use of these various methods. We will then go on to examine the language learning process, starting with the development of speech in young infants during the first year of life. This is the time associated with the emergence of the skills of speech perception. In other words, an emergence of the child's awareness of his or her own ability to speak. We will continue with our examination of the language learning process, this time by looking at language learning in the older child, that is, in children under five. As they mature, it's possible to begin analysis in conventional linguistic terms. And so, in our analysis, we will look at phonological, grammatical and semantic development in preschool children. In the second part of the talk, I would like to review some educational approaches to the question of how linguistic skills can be developed. In other words, how can we assist the young child to learn language skills at school? Initially, we will look at issues that arise in relation to spoken language. We will then look at reading and review a number of approaches that have been proposed in relation to the teaching of reading. Finally, we will conclude today's talk with an account of current thinking about the most neglected area of all, the child's developing awareness of written language. Unit 7, Extract 3. You're going to hear part of a lecture about the introduction of cane toads into Australia. First, look at questions 1 to 5. Now listen and answer questions 1 to 5. In today's lecture, I want to look at one of Australia's least loved animals, but one that has an interesting history from which I think we can learn a fundamental lesson about problem solving. While Australia is famous for its many wonderful native animals, in particular the kangaroo and the koala, it also has some less attractive animals, many of which were actually brought to Australia in the 19th and 20th centuries. Perhaps the most well-known introduced animal is the rabbit, brought originally by the early settlers as a source of food. 
Another animal to be introduced by the settlers was the fox, for the purpose of sport in the form of fox hunting. But perhaps the most unusual animal ever brought here was the cane toad. Here's a picture of one. It's a large and, some people would say, very ugly species of toad and was deliberately imported to this country by the sugarcane farmers in 1935 to eradicate the beetle which kills the sugarcane plant. The cane beetle is the natural enemy of the sugarcane plant. It lives in the cane and drops its eggs onto the ground around the base of the plant. The eggs develop into grubs and then the grub eats the roots of the cane, resulting in the death of the plant. In the mid-thirties, there was a serious outbreak of cane beetle, and the farmers became desperate to get rid of the pest which was ruining their livelihood. Now you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Listen to the rest of the lecture and answer questions 6 to 10. Meanwhile, news was trickling in from overseas about a toad, native to Central America, which supposedly ate the beetles which killed the cane. It was reported that the toad had been taken to Hawaii, where cane is also grown, and introduced with apparent success. So, with the backing of the Queensland authorities, the farmers arranged to import 100 toads from Hawaii. The toads were then released into the cane fields to undertake the eradication of the cane beetle. As predicted, the toads started to breed successfully, and within a very short time their numbers had swollen. But there was one serious problem. It turned out that cane toads do not eat cane beetles. And the reason for this is that toads live on insects that are found on the ground and the cane beetle lives at the top of the cane plant, well out of reach of the toads. In fact, they never come into contact with each other. Now you may well ask, how did this terrible mistake ever happen? And the reason is quite simply that the farmers were desperate to find a way of ridding their fields of the cane beetle and so they accepted the reports that had been written without ever doing their own research. And the added irony is that in 1947, just 12 years later, an effective pesticide was developed which kills the beetle, thereby ensuring the survival of the sugarcane industry to this day. Meanwhile, much of tropical northeast Australia is infested with the cane toad, which serves no purpose whatsoever, and experts claim that the toad is spreading south in plague proportions. Now, as agricultural scientists, we have to ask ourselves, what lessons are to be learned from this tale? And I can think of three main points. Firstly, one should never rely on claims which are not backed up by evidence, i.e., in this case, evidence that the cane toad actually eats the grub of the cane beetle and thereby kills the pest. Secondly, we should look very carefully at possible effects of introducing any living species into a new environment, and lastly, one should not allow one's decision-making to be influenced by a sense of desperation which may cloud the issue. In other words, one should always seek objective advice. IELTS Sample Listening Test You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one of your question booklet. Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a student and someone at an accommodation agency. First, look at questions 1 and 2. For each of the questions, three alternatives are given.
decide which of the alternatives, A, B, or C, best fits what you hear on the tape, and circle the appropriate letter. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to the example will be played first. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm looking for a place to rent near the university. What are you after? A house? A flat? A, a room? Well, preferably a house if that's possible. There are three of us looking all together. We thought we might share if we could find something suitable. The student says he wants to rent a house, so A has been circled. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions one and two. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm looking for a place to rent near the university. What are you after? A house? A flat? A, a room? Well, preferably a house if that's possible. There are three of us looking all together. We thought we might share if we could find something suitable. So, something near the university? Yes, if that's at all possible. We're all students, so it'd be good if we could find something within walking distance of the campus. None of us has a car and we don't want to have to take public transport. <laughs> yeah, well, everybody wants that, of course. Yeah, I suppose they do. Are you in your first year? No, I've been here a year already. Last year we all lived in a hall of residence. That was really great. Even the food wasn't too bad. <laughs> we had a lot of fun there, but in the second year they kick you out into the real world. You now have a short time to look at questions 3 to 10. As you listen to the rest of the conversation, fill in the numbered spaces 3 to 6 in the table and answer questions 7 to 10 by circling the appropriate letters. OK, so let me have a look and see what we've got. Uh, well, there's a two-bedroom house in Newtown, which is quite cheap. Oh, that'd be good because it's very near the university. But if we all want our own rooms, it isn't really big enough. Too small. Give that one a miss? Yeah, I think so. Got anything else? Uh, what about this? Three bedroom flat close to the university. It's uh, $400 a week. Oh, that's too expensive. All right. Ah, well, here's something that might interest you. It's a three bedroom house with garden. Not bothered about the garden, but where is it? Near the airport. That's miles from the university. Yes, it is quite far, but it's reasonably priced at $250 a week. Why don't you go and have a look? Oh, all right, we will. Can I have the address? Right. Well, it's at uh, 14A Station Road, Botany. Is anyone living there at the moment? No, it's vacant. And does it have any furniture? Uh... Well, it says here that it's partially furnished. What does that mean exactly? Well, there's a kitchen table and chairs, two single beds, a double bed, two wardrobes, a kitchen cooker and a washing machine. Not bad, really, for the money. Is there a fridge? Uh, it doesn't mention it here. I can let you have the key. And you can pop round and see for yourself. Right, thanks. We'll do that. Hello, you're back. How did you find the house? Well, not bad. It's certainly large enough and there's quite a big garden. But it's completely overgrown. 
<laughs> you can hardly get out the back door because the grass is so high. We'd have to have it tidied up a bit before we moved in. OK. The kitchen is fine, but there's an awful smell throughout the house. Uh, well, the place hasn't been occupied for a couple of months, so that's probably why it's a bit musty. It'll be fine when you open up the windows and let some fresh air in. <laughs> yeah, well, I think the landlord ought to pay to clean the carpets at least. I can put that to him, though I'm not sure whether he'll agree. We can but ask. OK. Well, if he does, we'd probably be interested. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear an extract from a radio program. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen and complete the notes by filling in the numbered spaces 11 to 14. Hello and welcome to Cooking Capers. And this week we're looking at that most versatile and aromatic of plants, a fairly recent addition to the list of Australian agricultural produce, but nevertheless, a great favourite today, ginger. And in the studio to tell us all about it is Monica Maxwell. Ginger, mmm, is one of my personal favourite spices. And I've got a number of wonderful recipes to share with you later on in the program. So what is ginger? Well, actually, it's a spicy tasting root with an aromatic flavour. It's related to the bamboo family and has a hundred different uses in the kitchen. The Chinese have cultivated it for years, particularly to use in medicine, though you're probably more familiar with its culinary uses. But first, let's take a brief look at its history before we look at how it can be used, because it's had a very interesting history. Ginger originated in the southern provinces of China and in India, where it had been used in medicines and food preparation for over 5,000 years. The early traders who came upon the plant took it to many parts of the world, such as Nigeria, the West Indies, Central America, East Africa and even Indonesia. Ginger became extremely popular because of its exotic aromatic properties and was highly valued by spice traders in the 17th and 18th centuries because they were able to sell it back in Europe for a very good price. Although Australia is now the largest producer of ginger in the world, it wasn't grown in Australia until the early 20th century. Now look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the talk and complete the table and the fact sheet by filling in numbered spaces 15 to 20. Apparently, some pieces of raw ginger found their way to an area about 100 kilometres north of Brisbane in Queensland earlier this century. The comparatively high rainfall and humidity in this area produced conditions which are perfect for growing ginger. So it became well established. But in the early days, the relatively high cost of production placed it at a disadvantage in the market by comparison with the much cheaper ginger produced by other countries with lower production costs. Then, in 1941, the supply of ginger to Australia started to run out. Remember, this was in the middle of the Second World War, 
when everything was in short supply. This provided the perfect opportunity for the Queensland growers to expand their production and sales. Five local farmers got together and formed a cooperative association in a place called Budderham. They started with only twenty-five pounds between them. That was in the days when Australian currency was pounds, not dollars. So they set up the company with two wooden vats and fourteen tons of raw ginger. But they went on to become the most successful ginger farmers in the world. In fact, nearly all the world's ginger now comes from the Budderham Ginger Factory in Queensland. Forty percent of the production is used in Australia, and the remaining sixty percent is exported overseas to places like Europe, North America, South Africa, and even to Asia, where it originated in the first place. So now let's move on to looking at ways of using ginger in the kitchen. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. In this section, you will hear a radio interview with a scientist, Dr. Clark, on the subject of global warming. First, look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. As you listen, complete sentences 21 to 25. Dr. Clark, global warming was the threat of the 1980s, but it seems to have fizzled out of people's minds. Why do you think that is? Yes, in a way, you're right. I think scientists have become occupied with the task of trying to find out whether it really is happening, and if so, whether it's caused by human activity. A greenhouse effect is, after all, a natural phenomenon. Yes. As we know, naturally occurring gases float above us, acting as insulators that prevent heat being radiated into space. And the fear is that the insulation might get thicker. Yes. And because of this, the Earth might get warmer. The latest prediction we've heard is that temperature will increase by about a third of a degree every ten years. What are your feelings? Well, this prediction is difficult to make. You see, the global climate is the result of a web of influences. Who is to say that a simple action such as adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere will not have several effects which might even cancel each other out? And I understand that the prediction is hard to verify, whatever. Precisely. Why is that? Because the Earth's temperature surges and subsides naturally. In fact, the best way of detecting global temperature change is to measure the temperature of the oceans as accurately as possible. And this avoids the sort of seasonal fluctuations of the temperature of land mass. Yes. In fact, an understanding of the oceans is crucial to understanding how the global climate works.、Ah. The ocean transports heat around the globe. It's like a great reservoir of heat. A tiny change in sea surface temperature denotes a huge change in the amount of heat it is storing. Now look at questions twenty-six to thirty. As you listen to the rest of the interview, answer questions twenty-six to thirty. And now I understand you're looking at ways of refining this measurement of ocean temperature. 
Yes. For a long time, we've measured it by placing thermometers in buoys bobbing in the oceans, and also when ships draw water through their engines. It's also been done by satellite, hasn't it? Yes, but now data from a more promising system is being collected. This is the European Long Track Scanning Radiometer, or ATSR, a much simpler name. <laughs> the ATSR orbits the Earth above us. And what stage are you at with this? Well, it's been up there two and a half years now. Mm -hmm. It's an infrared detector that senses the Earth's temperature with great accuracy, and this is what we need. Mm -hmm. We have to be able to separate out random changes in temperature. I believe there are other advantages as well. Mm, there are several. Every few days it covers the entire Earth, so it produces large quantities of data. It measures the temperature from two angles, which allows correction for any effects that the intervening atmosphere may be having on its readings. Its field of view has a width of 500 kilometers, and it measures the temperature to 0.3 degrees centigrade. And it should go on for years? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Clark, for talking to us today. And now over to you, Sue, in our Manchester. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You're going to hear a talk about an animal conservation course. First look at questions 31 to 40. As you listen, complete the notes by filling in numbered spaces 31 to 40. Well, we're delighted to have the opportunity to hear from Sue Gent, our specialist on student affairs, about a course with a difference. Thank you, Tony. Many people think that conservation is just about saving fluffy animals. What they don't realize is that it is a war to save the human race from committing suicide. Strong words, but this was the belief of the famous conservationist Gerald Durrell. Gerald Durrell was an English conservationist who dedicated his life to the conservation of animals, and among his many achievements was the establishment of a zoo in Jersey. There, he set up the Wildlife Preservation Trust, which conducts courses on preservation and attracts students from developing countries. Many of these students are making their first trip away from home. The students who come to Jersey to study are of all ages. The first was a man called Yusuf Mungru, who came from Mauritius in 1977. He was particularly interested in the conservation of large African birds. When he arrived, there were only four Mauritius falcons, these are big birds of prey, left in his African homeland. Now, since he has returned, the numbers have increased to 200. When Yusuf first arrived in Jersey, he was unused to the freezing winters, so he liked to spend time in the reptile house. He said it was the warmest place on the island. So let's look at how students are chosen to participate in one of the zoo's programs. Well, according to their teacher, their work or study must involve animals. The zoo is proud of the fact that many of its graduates are now in positions to influence the way animals are kept and utilised for conservation. Once they start the course, 
The students have to spend a lot of time studying the English language. In addition to that, they also have to cover many aspects of animal conservation. This year, 27 students from 21 different countries are already waiting to participate in the intensive training programs at the zoo. In a principles and practice course, they learn both theory and practice. First, they learn the theory of conservation biology, working in areas such as veterinary medicine. Then they move into the practical part of the course and work with the zookeepers, where they learn to care for the animals. Over 350 full-time students have graduated since Yusuf Mungri, and, like him, some graduates have made big names for themselves in the zoo and conservation world. A former Chinese student is now responsible for captive breeding and conservation throughout his country, and a student from Mauritius who trained at the zoo is the present conservation officer for Mauritius. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. End of side two.